Good afternoon. Hey, everybody. Uh, we're on the couch, and actually, we're in the studio today, so it's a little bit different, but glad to see y'all chiming in, and I appreciate all the compliments. Uh, and Who's complimenting? I got compliments. On your outfit? No. You mean like right I'm now? I'm talking about on the couch, the platform itself. So. Oh, did I get compliments? We already starting out. All right. Okay. Bad, Sorry. Bad leg. Sorry. Bad okay. Leg. So you you can see that there's people on already. There's like yes. three people on already. Yes. Okay. So what do you want to do the introduction now? Oh, you can see three. Yeah, there's yeah. it's live. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, go ahead, Miss Jackie. All right. So, uh, I'm Jackie, as most of you know, and this is Damien. Um, and we're the co-hosts of The Couch. And then we have a guest, Dr. Kendall Jasper, here today. Yes, yes, and here yes. he is, um, bald, bold, and beautiful right here. <laughs> Let's go. Um, <laughs> Triple B. Let's do it. So a brief introduction of Dr. Jasper. He is a clinical psychologist, and he is the owner of a community uh, behavioral health agency. Mm -hmm. So we have him on for uh, his expertise today. Absolutely. And we have a lineup of questions that we thought might be useful mm -hmm. um, for him to provide information based on previous interviews that he's done that we researched and then based on what we know about him as a clinician. All right, absolutely. Okay? We're, we're definitely proud uh, to have Dr. Jasper and I've known him for years. And one thing that I will say that he's a, a real dude, definitely. We'll see oh, how real he is. I <laughs> no, I know Dr. Jasper too, for years. Go ahead, Damien. It's a competition. It's, um, it's, it's, it's early. It it's is. It's early. I know. But, but definitely, I, I want to get Dr. Jasper to kind of chime in and kind of give, um, I guess maybe just a, from a historical perspective, what kind of got you into this particular field as being a psychologist. And first, I guess first and foremost, especially for the listeners, mm -hmm. um, What's the difference, you know, between a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and a mm -hmm. therapist? A licensed because therapist. Of, yeah, a lot, okay. of, a lot of people don't know. Okay, well, I'll start with the second question. So, okay. psychologists um, are, have doctorates in philosophy. Actually, we are the original doctor, believe it or not, mm -hmm. because before they gave out MDs, and there was an American um, Medical Association. Right. Anyone that was a doctor had a doctor degree in philosophy in some form. Mm -hmm. Even for those that practice medicine right. before, they gave individuals MDs. So uh, the main difference between someone like myself as a licensed clinical psychologist is that we have uh, doctors of philosophy in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. um, you have social psychologists, developmental psychologists, but we are the only ones that are able to diagnose um, and in some states prescribe medicine to individuals oh, wow. who um, are experiencing mental health related issues. Right. Psychiatrists are individuals that are MDs. Mm -hmm. uh, they are medical doctors. Right. Um, and their track is a little bit different. Um, and then therapists, we're, we all can fall in that therapist range. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of psychiatrists that don't do as much therapy as some of the other disciplines. Uh, they do a lot more uh, medication, initial medication evals, medication sort of checkups, 15 minute checkups, kind of get people in and out. And that's not to say they don't provide them a, a pretty solid level of care, but they right. just do it a little different. And then of course you have licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical search workers, licensed marriage and family therapists, licensed clinical addiction specialists. Um, and I guess they kind of lump those individuals more in what people think of therapists. But right. we're all trained in some way, shape, or form to provide mm -hmm. a, a level of therapy. Right. So, how did I find myself here? Um, brutally honest with you, when I was in college, uh, I was playing basketball, I got a call during the summertime from the secretary of the basketball team, uh, April, and April says, Kendall, you need to declare major today. If you don't declare major, you're gonna be ineligible. Okay. I'm just sounds, keeping it yeah. up. Sounds great. So, Living the truth, right? <laughs> I was like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. She's like, well, you're taking two psychology classes. What about psychology? I said, sounds like a plan to me. <laughs> and I hung the phone up. I right. That. So <laughs> my major was declared for me, uh -huh. psychology. And um, when I finished school and, you know, was figuring out my whole basketball career, what I'm going to do next, mm -hmm. um, I identified that I wanted to go back to school. It was even going to be medical school or go to school um, to get a PhD as a psychologist or go to, to, to um, 
actually to law school. I, I hadn't decided okay. yet. So I looked at it and I always told my mom I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I felt like, okay, well, let's, let's take this track. It seemed to be a little more engaging mm -hmm. than what I thought I would get out of going to medical school to become a psychiatrist okay. based on my research. Right. And as you can tell, I like to talk. I listen pretty well. People right. may not believe that <laughs> because I, 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 I will have a, a com robust conversation with you. Uh -huh. But I do listen pretty well. So, okay. you know, that's how I find myself here. So you got a nice balance of the two. Yeah. Talk well, listen well. I try. Well, we're, I mean, since we're having a conversation, I want to know now uh, what got you into uh, the field of counseling, why you decided to become uh, an LPC. Hmm. Well, mine, I guess mine is kind of similar to Dr. Jasper's here. I kind of fell into it. Um, hmm. my, my aunt actually uh, was a director over DSS in my hometown. So while I was in college, I would do sort of like a peer mentorship mm -hmm. for like middle schoolers, mm -hmm. you know, high school kids that, that were at risk. So at that point in time, they, they didn't have like the CBS workers and all this stuff. So I, I guess I was like one of those original type people to be in, be in the classroom or take them out in the afternoon and just provide peer mentorship just through my experiences. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to graduating because my undergrad was in business administration had nothing to do with mental health, social okay. work, or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I happened to fall into a situation to where I was doing like basic customer service stuff, like working for Sprint and selling insurance and things like that. I'm definitely not a seller. Um, Most but, of us aren't. <laughs> but then I ended up, uh, again, falling back into that peer mentorship type of role mm -hmm. in providing community-based services. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be offered to me. It's like, hey, you know, per hour was, was pretty decent for someone coming straight out of college. I was like, mm -hmm. well, let me see what, what this turns out to be. And that's how I ended up meeting Dr. Jasper. Mm -hmm. Really? And Gaston. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was providing one-on-one -on -one service. That's and I was like, this this guy is dope. I, I actually like. Don't him up, Damien. No, it's like, He's seriously, like, <laughs> we, we may have t t taken, like, different tracks. Mm -hmm. But I think the foundation of me wanting to become a therapist and actually indulging in emotions and the psychology of how one, you know, a person thinks was clearly due to that. You know, okay. and, I, and I saw a black man, <clears throat> doctor, it's like, yo, like, that's dope. I can see myself doing it. And, and we work for an interesting company. Yeah, we <laughs> yes. Very interesting. <laughs> that shall remain nameless. That shall remain nameless. <laughs> exactly. Whoa. That's always how it goes. But, okay. but that's how I kind of fell into it. And I, and I kind of just continued on going and went back to school to get my master's. And mm. here I am. Been okay. in this field roughly about ugh, 15 years almost. Interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good to know. What about, about you? you? Like, I guess we're doing some self disclosure here. Oh. Let's go. Okay, so you found out in college and then you found out after college. Yes. But I knew before college. So uh -huh. I was in high school. It was uh, my junior and senior year between there, and I had to declare what um, foreign language I was going to take. And okay. so, of course, I had myself geared up for Spanish. Spanish, Spanish. I mean, I had taken so many years of Spanish, and then my mother told me Spanish is full. So I had Japanese or German. And so I was like, nah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to mess with the German stuff because I felt like it was harder in theory. Mm -hmm. I hadn't, didn't know anything about either one, but I felt it was harder in theory. So I chose what I thought was easier, which is Japanese. I wound up in honors Japanese because there was no regular Japanese available. So then I got booted into an honors class of something, a language I had never studied. Mm -hmm. I studied four years of honors Japanese and I got an A uh, every year. And so I wow. figured international fashion design, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so going to college, I thought international fashion design. When I got to my small liberal arts school in uh -huh. Greensboro for all girls, and there was no international fashion design, I had not thought that through, that I probably would have had to go to a larger school uh, mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. do that, and maybe a white school versus an all-black school, right. let's call it what it is. I hadn't thought that through. So once I got there and they had the list of majors, I was like, you know, I had a therapist when I was 15, and she didn't know what the hell she was doing. So I want to do that. And so that's when I decided, when I signed up um, freshman year, that I was going to be a psych major. I got A's in psych. I got A's in stats. And I did well. And then I started interning while in college um, 
for a local school, and I realized I like to be with kids. Mm -hmm. So my junior year in college, I went to Ramapo Anchorage Camp, which is a camp for kids with behavioral and emotional disorders in Rhinebeck, right. New York. It is very popular. Um, for they, they only take kids with certain diagnosis to the camp. Okay. So my father told me, if you can make it through the camp, you should be a therapist. And if you can't, you need to look at something else. And so I made it through the camp um, at 20 years old. And I graduated with a bachelor's in psychology, and then I got my master's in counseling and ever since. But Dr. Jasper Ola is also one of um, the first few employers I had after I got my provisional license. And I, I appreciate the opportunity you gave me working let's under go, you. Let's go, let's We're go. Working Bye. under you help let's mold go. me, let's especially go. when a client went eight nuts crazy <laughs> on me. Oh, wow. And, um, you let's know, go. we had a little talk after that, and so I kind of learned how to respond to clients in certain type of heated situations. Right. Dr. Jess is very good for that type of advice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no matter how it sounds at first, it usually <laughs> works. So that's my story. Okay. I always knew. Yeah. Different, nice, different approach. Yeah. Different perspective. Well, thank you. No, first of all, I didn't, I didn't, I, I knew a little more there. I didn't know yeah. Damien, like it, because we were in a situation where it was, yeah, it was tough, man. It was tough. Our head was on fire a little but, bit. But I saw the <laughs> the, the long range, yeah, yeah, what it, what it should have been. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, For sure. And, I, and that's what I wanted it to be. And I'm, I've always been an advocate of mental health and people, uh, I guess, minorities, in, in generally speaking. Um, but definitely mental health and reducing the stigma associated mm -hmm. with mental health because, honestly, everybody has mental health issues at some point in time. So. Well, I think my, my thing is more instinctually driven by somebody made an imprint on me and it wasn't a good one. My therapist was not a good listener. Mm -hmm. she, I felt uh -huh. like she used her own personal stuff to bring out when she was working with me. And therefore, I acted out in ways that showed my parents I was not interested in seeing her anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to college and I declared the major, I was like, all right, I'm going to show everyone how it should be done mm -hmm. and I'm going to hear kids. Mm -hmm. And even though, you know, these kids drive us nuts, you know, I, my thing is I want to hear them and we don't get paid what we should be, Absolutely. but I'm going to hear the kids. And mm -hmm. that's why I pride myself on always wanting to work with the kids. So that's mm -hmm. it. So, um, that is a segue into the difference in clinical assessments. Mm -hmm. And we want you to tell everyone, uh, when you should be getting the notion that you should take your child for a psychological assessment versus mm -hmm. just a typical clinical assessment done by a uh, mental health clinician? Well, here, here's what's interesting. I, I think you could always take your child for an initial psychological assessment because I think it's going to give you as much as if, if a psychologist is, is good at what he or she does. If you are good at what you do. Well, I mean, I wasn't necessarily talking. I'm talking about, about you. Me, You'll find saying. what <laughs> if, if you're good at what you do. Well, you yeah, if, but if you're good at what you do, then you're gonna ask those questions. You're gonna mm -hmm. ask what the presenting issues are. You're gonna ask family history. You're gonna ask social history, depending on what they're referred for and it's relevant. Mm -hmm. So what it's gonna do is hopefully it will help clean up the picture of what we're experiencing right. because there are so many different um, testing measures that Absolutely. we can administer, questionnaires that we can give that will clue into what's going on, whether it's a DSM issue or not. You know, the first place that we need to start, of course, is how is this person achieving, mm -hmm. right? Well, intellectually, where are they? Right. What's their level of insight? Mm -hmm. Because all of that matters on, you know, how they're behaving, the choices that they're making, and then for a treatment pro protocol, what's gonna be realistic? Mm -hmm. What kind of therapeutic interventions are we going to be able to provide to this individual and or this family that that's going to make sense? Yeah, I, I, you know, today was an interesting day. And I'm interesting you asked me that question because I was out in Morganton, North Carolina, Hickory, North Carolina today doing a behavior plan. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Wow. Um, and this is someone who I know in the business. Mm -hmm. She has an agency. She asked me to help her out and do some behavior plans. And time and time again, part of the issue that we're having is, and it's part of I it. see that fly. Do you see yeah, it? I see it. Like, yeah. it like, I don't know I what's going down right here. Like, let mouth. me live, please. You, do, you did a good let job. Me, do you see me, though? Right. Okay. Do you see I'm focused. So we see a fly. Let me live. I apologize. So anyway, all right, go ahead, brother. But 
<laughs> Go ahead, brother. Back to business. Okay, Minister mm-hmm. Farrakhan. Okay, well, you so, know. So, okay. But um, there has to be a conversation with them about what's realistic. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and some of these young men and women are 17 and 18 years old, and they're engaging in behavior that 9 and 10 year olds mm-hmm. are engaging mm-hmm. in. But intellectually, they are at a mm-hmm. intellectual age of a 9 and 10 year old. Right. Mm-hmm. So... It may it may look like an anomaly to you. It may look interesting because you're mm-hmm. saying, "This kid is 17. He should not be behaving in this way." Okay. No, we we've got to identify where he is intellectually mm-hmm. to better explain and developing that developmentally. Excuse me to explain why you're seeing these behaviors. So right. first, you need to classify whether he it is appropriate for him to behave based right. on his intellect. Absolutely, okay. and then okay. that that helps us set up a plan. A realistic plan on what what you should be doing, mm-hmm. what kind of model you should be setting up, and then what you could ex- what you should expect, right. mm-hmm. and that hopefully that reduces the level of frustration mm-hmm. associated with the idea that the chronological age says something, the intellectual age says something else, and the behavior is somewhere in the middle, right. and you're saying I can't believe my 18 year old child is acting like this right. or behaving in this manner. Mm-hmm. So I do think that the the psychological evaluation will give you the information that a comprehensive clinical assessment mm-hmm. will give you. Unless it's specific. Right. If, if you only want me to identify what your intellectual ability is, then I would focus in on that. But if, you, if someone comes into my office and they say, hey, listen, um, I, I need my son or my daughter or my brother or my sister to see you. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to identify what's going on with that individual. Right. Some of the first things that I'm going to do, start getting the report, self-report, if I can, mm-hmm. and then the collateral report in different forms of material that's right. going to streamline it and make it very clear so it's organized and exactly. it's not all over the map. Let me stop so. you for a second. So I'm in the comments because we need to at least every several, you know, kind of touch on one right. of these. So, um, did you make a statement about the child not being fully present? Or not being all there? Fully present? No, not being all there. Did you say, like, if the child's not all there or something like that? I didn't. Okay, because I think Rashawn was asking, when you say not all not all there, do you mean not fully present? No, I, if, if I did say that, I didn't necessarily okay. mean I didn't to say that. that. I, I don't think okay. I said that, but um, what I mean is is that the, maybe not all there in terms of their chronological age. Chronological age. Right. And what I mean age. is that yes. the right. kid hasn't matured. Right. Their intellectual ability and their behaviors haven't matured to... Right where they are in their chronological age. Right. Okay. That maybe right. to clarify that. Um, also, let's just go b- based on what I see here, right? Yeah. So yeah, Elise fine. was saying she would want to know what a yeah, therapist Elise. does. Hey, boo. What a therapist does to decompress. Like all the horror stories that they hear and mm-hmm. things that we soak up during mm-hmm. a session or a day full of sessions. Right. So I want to start with Dr. Jasper and then you go and okay. then I'll go and we'll just yeah. touch on that real quick. Yeah. I'm an interesting dude like that. So... Like, once I leave, I leave, right? And and I used to go to the gym and just shoot around by myself some. But, you know, I, 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 I honestly think this, right? Because of because of where I grew up, mm-hmm. right? And the, the things that I have seen and experienced in my life growing up in East New York, Brooklyn, right. I always feel like it could be a lot worse, mm. right? So when I... When people sit across from me, number one, I'm very empathetic towards Mm -hmm. them and sympathetic towards them because I have seen and witnessed and experienced some of that on the corner of my block with a crack house on the corner and my homeboy living two doors down from me without lights on in the crib and coming to my house having to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, I get all that. Like, Mm -hmm. we were fortunate to not really be faced with a lot of that, but we faced some hard times. But um, I've seen violence at a young age. I've seen drugs at a young age. I've familiarized myself with the territories of who are the hustlers and the drug dealers, right. you know, the pimps and the prostitutes, all of those different things growing up, the, the areas that are dangerous. So for me, when I do get that, like, I feel it, mm-hmm. but I, my, my philosophy is it could always be a lot worse. So when I leave, although it's heavy, I don't feel like I need to go take a walk or go to the gym and get a burn working out right. or any of that. I, I'm just like, listen, 
it's 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 all good. Like right. it's, it's a fu- it's a function of life. I thought you almost said something else. It's like this is a family. No, show. no, I've, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Not at all. No, but age. but you you know what I mean. Like yeah. that's just me. That's right. my approach. Right. Um, and again, I don't want that to to come off as me being nonchalant, nonchalant. about people's issues mm-hmm. because I'm not. And right. people will tell you, right. I'm very in tune and I will help. Right. You know, I I get people all the time that call me, DM me. You know, whether that's, I saw you on the Breakfast Club or Sway, right. do you right. have some time? Right. I talked to somebody like that yesterday, and I told her in a week, I'm going to check up on you. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned it. I signed her some homework. Right. Like on some yeah. CBT, CBT type. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I signed her some homework, and I said, next week, like, we're going to talk, because I'm genuinely interested in what's right. going on. Some a young lady that I was on the show with, she texted me today, and she mm-hmm. was like, Doc, what's good? I'm, I'm seeing... You know, this is going on. I'm going to tune in. And I'm like, I'm good. How are you? She's like, I'm doing great. You know what I mean? But that's where I am. Right. So it doesn't mean I don't care. It just means that I maybe I have the ability to just say, that was heavy. But I've I've seen it a lot heavy. Right. Okay. So your thing is based on individual experience over the years growing up and environmental, um, uh, I guess, absorption, you mm-hmm. have learned throughout your life to right. kind of block things out and be done mm-hmm. with it when you're done with it. I'm not, I don't block it out. Okay. See, because we can't block anything out. Okay. We can't. We can't. Maybe I'm using the wrong phrase. Yeah, like, we, set it aside, put it on the Once shelf. we experience something, you can't forget that memory of right. what transpired. But you put it on right? a shelf and you take it off the shelf yeah. when it's time well, I can, back. Because I, I always remind myself to control what I can. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in a house where my parents reinforce that idea okay. control what you can right. you know my dad used to use it when it came to the when it came to the young ladies all the time right say look bro you can't control if she likes you or not right that that was it he's got three boys First growing lesson. up in the house <laughs> right it's me and two older brothers mm-hmm. look you can't control if she's gonna like you or not right you can't control what she does furthermore if you're not around her you worrying about what she's doing is not going to change the outcome of whatever she's doing. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Control what you can. Exactly. So I take that message everywhere with me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to control the things I can, the things that are beyond my control. I'm going to try to gain a perspective on them. Mm-hmm. A consistent perspective. Right. Because I have to remind myself okay. right. at times, control what you can, control what you can. Because I'm human. Okay. So there are Absolutely. things that I continue to worry about. And I'm like, come on, okay, you can't worry about that. Like, right. It, it has nothing to do with you. Like, you can't control that situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's my next nickname for y'all be calling you gay. Um, okay. <laughs> well, okay. We appreciate that. So, Damien, I follow your Instagram, so I know what you do um, for your self-care. But I want you to tell everybody how you decompress. I, I Come on, because I, I can tell I, it. I, I can tell it myself. That, I don't know what that means. Okay. But, well, go okay. ahead. Follow but, Damien's Instagram, and you'll know. Go ahead, bro. But but kind of like what Kendall was saying, it's kind of like... As a therapist, that you're you're often empathetic, and sometimes you get that transference from their particular story. Something some of it may hit home. You may have be working with a family that's dealing with domestic violence, and if you experience it or or witness it in your home, it's going to draw something up in you. Sure. Um, in a variety of di- different situations, I have my troubles and things like that. So a lot of a lot of uh, topics and a lot of clients that I deal with have had similar issues. So I can easily put myself in their position in order to allow them to kind of gain a better perspective and understanding that your situation should not be your outcome. You can Mm -hmm. always overcome that. Um, But as far as decompress, um, I, for one, compartmentalize. Like, I think I have a skill of like that, what do you call the type of memory, like photographic type of memory like I can pick up a conversation from last where week. Where it left off. Mm-hmm. Where it left off at. All right, put it on the shelf. Mm-hmm. I cannot. <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? Leave, go to the next client if I need. So okay. if I'm going home, disconnect, like like Kendall was saying, just disconnect and not necessarily worry about it. I can't worry about whether that client's going to have a panic attack this mm-hmm. evening or they're going to have some suicidal ideations. Hopefully mm-hmm. we have a plan set in place so those things do not happen. Mm-hmm. But if they do, I can't control it. I can't worry mm-hmm. about you know, maybe I should hit John up, see how he's doing at 9 o'clock at night. Just don't make any sense. So I, I make sure that I compartmentalize, but I also do the front work in making sure that I am teaching the clients, you know, 
the, the appropriate protocols, establishing those boundaries, so on and so forth. So once I'm off, I'm off. I can be I can be Damien, I can be Dame, I can be what what I am outside of the business world. Yeah, I think you're totally different. I've seen you outside of even outside the office and what seeing you walk around inside Tim, the office is like Tim, Tim, too Tim, Tim, Okay. Tim, well Tim. anyway, in case but, people from the office. But but again, just just decompressing I I still still play football. I've been playing flag football for like the longest. Um, that that's something that I that I utilize to kind of get that energy out. Uh, music is one of my biggest things. Like that's what I do when I get home. Turn on the music and just vibe out, or okay. hang around with friends, or you know, my, my lady, or whatever the case may be. That that's my time to decompress from today. Just not only with the the clientele, but just the business aspect of mental health can also be. You know, overwhelming at times. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. Well, that sounds wonderful. You want to move on to the next question now? Your question. Um, I I mean, I don't really want to talk about what I do because I don't think I do it as well as you all do. I mean, no, I just don't. Your, your I don't. way is your way. Your, your My way. way is I indulge in myself, so that's what I have to do. I feel like I'm indulged in everyone but myself for a certain amount of hours right. in the day. I know that the first thing I had to do was change my job. Um, so, you know, I had to change my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I'm a little closer to you because, you know, I work for you now. So I appreciate that, number one. But I knew I had to get out. And so at that point, I hollered at Dr. Jasper and I was like, yo, this isn't working for me. It's going to kill me. And it was. Uh, where I was was going to kill me. And it was, it was driving me to a point of losing sanity. And you have to recognize that first, I feel. Absolutely. I wish I had known it sooner, but it hit me kind of hard very right. fast. Right. And so then my thing was like, where's the backup plan? Where's the backup for the backup plan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that was number one in trying to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Then when I'm there, I handle all the things that I can and I'm doing better about accepting. I cannot handle this, this is not about me. And right. when I'm removed from it, it still continues. So there's nothing I can do. I can't step in front of the boulder. The boulder keeps going. And so that's really how I try to look at it when I leave the establishment, mm -hmm. <laughs> the establishment daily. And so when I get home, honestly, there's about two days a week, starting I guess Wednesday and Friday, I gift myself. I have a nice rum chata. So I don't do wine. R okay. Rum chata is Caribbean rum. I have one glass of it. It's like my little thing to myself. Like, yeah, you made it. It's like a celebration. <laughs> I have to have it on hump day, and I have to have it on Friday. Mm -hmm. One glass is enough, ladies. Don't try to overdo it. I mean, rum chowder, that'll do it. Okay. So I have half a glass or one whole glass over time. I mean, I got to let it sink in about an hour or two. So by the time I'm done with that, I feel like I've accomplished something. I feel like I have my sanity. I feel like I can appreciate where right. I ended the week right. or where I am in the middle of the week. And I can kind of relish in that. Mm -hmm. So there's mine. We have another question for you, mm -hmm. which would be, why is it so difficult for black men to show vulnerability, whether it's mm. in therapy or outside of it? Why is it difficult for all black people to show vulnerability? Sure, it's but I want to know about men because I'm a woman. Men. Well, this so is let my me, question. Let me, give you a, let me give you a historical perspective on vulnerability, vulnerability for black folks. Sure. Okay, so sharing, we equate sharing sometimes with vulnerability, right? So when in the history of black folks in America, have they been reinforced or rewarded for sharing? Don't worry, I'll wait. When? By what is the establishment, right? Mm -hmm. The majority race, the establishments that have, that have been put in place. When have they been rewarded? Okay? I submit myself for a study, you give me syphilis. And then you don't treat. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Tuskegee Spirit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have a doctor who's willing to um, do research, experiment on black women without the use of anesthesia, right? He becomes a world-renowned renowned gynecologist. Mm -hmm. they, got, they just took a statue down in New York, right? right? So we open our doors up to the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. There's a stark difference t at times in the manner in which we may parent mm -hmm. from others, we run the risk of getting our children removed. Now, let me be very clear. 
when it is necessary to move children out of homes, I completely understand. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, is that the perception is that anytime we are involved with sharing, it becomes more about disenfranchisement. And that's mm -hmm. the perception. Department of Justice, mm -hmm. police brutality, right? right? I share my license and my registration with you, or I go to share my license and my registration with you. I may end up getting shot and killed in a car. Right. So that vulnerable, being vulnerable in those circumstances has not been reinforced with positive, it hasn't been reinforced positively. Right. For me to say, I need to be able to share. Right? Now, let me talk a little bit about being a black man in America. Right? You have to have almost like a thuggish type mentality at times to achieve, to pursue, to fight because it's rough because there are so many landmines and pitfalls that exist. And to maintain peace of and mind. And to maintain. So it, it you have to find a balance there to be able to get into a space where it's okay to be vulnerable and it's it's rewarded. It's positively mm -hmm. rewarded. You know, um, I do think therapy is one of those places. But you also want to be able to connect and find the right type of person. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and everybody doesn't look like you. Everybody doesn't sound like you. Right. Everybody isn't interested in what you're interested in. And that doesn't mean, excuse me, that doesn't mean that you can't gain something or learn something from that individual. Mm -hmm. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is is that we if we come from like a sort of folk of kinship type of approach, coming all the way back from the motherland, then we're going to be more comfortable in a room in a space where you feel like I'm able to identify mm -hmm. with what you you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. a brother will tell you, you know what I'm saying? Like like brother, you know what I'm saying? Do you think? Uh, well, let me ask both of you. Do you think that? Uh, let's. I want to deal with the therapy aspect specifically. I want to know right. in you both of your opinion, personal opinion, doesn't have to be professional, mm -hmm. but in your opinion, do you believe that a black man coming to therapy would rather sit across from a black man who's the therapist? I, would he feel more comfortable? You know, you know I, I feel like a, a black person sitting across from another black person is in instantly going to feel more comfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, then there's a short period of time where that either can be strengthened or weakened or weakened, or it will totally erode. And you only get a certain amount of time. And you get a certain amount of time okay. to, to, you know, make that work, so to right. speak. Right? And I think that at, on the other end, we also have to deal with some of our own self-hatred type of deal. So, you know, that's part of why I, I, I dress down. Not that I have to, but, right. you know, I, there's always there's, a, there's already a difference between you and I. You're sitting across from me having to tell me what's going on. Right, right. So, I do it partly because I want to feel comfortable, but partly because I understand that there's a difference there. And you may feel like, oh, look at this uppity brother in exactly. here with this suit and tie on. Right. Now, other people say... Brother, I like, I, you know, I appreciate you looking that way, and I get it. So there are days that you can, can flip the script. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going into communities, which I used to do a lot of, I used to go in homes and in communities, and guess what? I don't want to look like an eyesore, so to speak. So I'm going to, you know, listen, when in Rome, do, you know, do what the Romans do. Like, it's a code to the street, so to speak. So, right. You know, I'm a, I'm a get it. I'm a mix it up. Okay. Um, but I think that, I think that some of that is a some of that is more stereotypical because believe it or not, brothers are are super vulnerable. And guess what? Brothers don't get it. They don't get more vulnerable when it comes to dealing with the sisters. Like a sister will break a brother down like nothing and or yeah. no one else. Absolutely. And if you want to see a brother vulnerable, let, let that sister push those right buttons and, and turn him up or break him down. Well, let me let me just say this. I'm asking this for a reason because mm -hmm. I make a lot of, and I, I know you know, but I make a lot of posts on Facebook 
out of frustration in the mental health community, okay? Mm -hmm. I do a lot of that, but I don't regret that, and we've had this conversation. I don't feel any kind of way about that. I feel like it's true to who I am. Like, you dress a certain way because it's true to who you are. Right. This is what I feel based on my passion. And people, men, black ones, are hitting up my inbox telling me, hey, I was on this medication for this period of time. I haven't told anybody. I didn't tell my friends. These are people I know. These are people I don't know. I know Absolutely. through other people. I have no judgment. If anything, I just give feedback and ask questions um, to their questions of whatever they need, right? Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it like, hey, you know, I know it took a lot for such and such to reach out. Mm -hmm. Number one, you said, you know, a woman can gauge a certain thing, but they don't even know me that well. Or I'm not in a relationship with them. We're not dating. But the simple fact that I brought it to the forefront makes them right. feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Absolutely. maybe you're right. Like even the way you dress brings to the forefront, this is who I am, you're just gonna get it. Absolutely. So if we can connect on that level, great. Right. And yeah. if you can't, that's just who you are. Well, you, you certainly right. have made some form of connection with them if they're willing to share. Oh yeah. Right, yeah. so you reinforce that sharing though. And, to, and the first thing that has to happen is, hey, listen, it was great that you shared that. Right. It was courageous, right. it was brave. Uh -huh. So now let me have you understand, you sharing what is most vulnerable to you, I'm going to covet and mm -hmm. I'm going to protect, exactly. which is only going to strengthen the idea that you Absolutely. can continue to share mm -hmm. with me because I'm not going to take it and I'm go not going to then post it later or put right. you on blast. Exactly. No, I'm going to protect that confidentiality mm -hmm. of you sharing it mm -hmm. with me and I'm going to say, hey, listen, okay, so let's figure out what's next for you. Right. Right. I may not be the person that can help you, but I can provide you mm -hmm. with a resource, right? And or if you have a quick question, feel free to hit me up. Right. And holler at me, mm -hmm. right? So it has to be, it, that has to be mm -hmm. rewarded because okay. it's not like people don't want to talk, mm -hmm. but something has led them to the point where they said, I feel like I can't talk. Mm -hmm. to this I don't to trust. Feel like not being what, heard. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I feel like I'm not being heard. Exactly. The last time I said something to somebody, they try to put me in a psychiatric hospital, exactly. and, and they the didn't even they mis they totally misunderstood what I was saying. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, there, there's there's so many innuendos. There's there's so many nuances and subtleties to our language, culturally, and the way that we talk to each other. Right. That that can be misunderstood by others who are not part of the culture and community. I get that a lot from my clients asking me um, if I tell you certain things are you going to do this mm -hmm. and I always I always tell them I'm not going to do anything mm -hmm. I may suggest to you that mm -hmm. these are things you need to do right. but I don't roll around with a van looking for people to snatch up and take yeah. them places and drop right. them off you know mm -hmm. Envy asked me a question when, when we were on the show and, and DJ Envy said mm -hmm. so when somebody gets a diagnosis of mm -hmm. something does it go in their record Right, like their record their for everybody record. to see. Mm -hmm. right. And I was like, "What? What record are, bro? What record are you talking about?" Right, Very right, general. no, no. But that is a that is a for bizarre, jobs, certainly for a misperception Absolutely. that people feel like if they come to see someone like us mm -hmm. and we diagnose them with something, it's going to go on this general record. Almost as if you, you do a you do a search a criminal search, right. it's going to show up that they were di they were diagnosed with, with bipolar, disorder. bipolar or major depressive disorder or something, and that's right. not how it works. Right, mm -hmm. you, you know. So we have to understand that we we have to make sure that we're sticking to that code of being confidential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and those ethics are very important because it lends itself yes. to that level of trust in that relationship. Absolutely. Okay. And, and I think just to piggyback on what you guys are talking about, the, the level of comfort that a, that a client has to have within you in order for the treatment process to even work. Be effective. Um, mm -hmm. And be effective, they have to be able to trust you in a, in a certain aspect. Most people are not willing to seek out treatment, again, because one, they, they felt like they may have experienced it before and it wasn't a pleasurable mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. They felt like they didn't get the help that they needed or they wasn't being heard or they think I'm crazy or, you know, something to, to, to that effect. So with me, um, I personally, as you can see, I, you know, I, mm -hmm. that, that's one of my pastimes. That's, that's one of my things as well mm -hmm. is tattoos. That's a self-care thing, but mm -hmm. that's another story. But I've, I've gotten nothing but positive in regards to 
my appearance because mm-hmm. I don't dress up just like you know said I don't dress up to go to work. I don't dress up either. Like the most you will get is a button up, but other than that, I I want that client to be comfortable with me and the way that I look. I'm hey I'm I'm black like I can't change that. Mm-hmm. It just is what it is. I just happen to have a license. And some education, and I know, happened. you know, I still know. have black people. You found problems. the license yeah. on you know? the ground. Yeah. Still have some black people so, problems. Let's be so, clear. So I, I just want them to kind of understand that. And the more, I guess, I'm able to, I, I guess, a little bit of self disclosure up front in developing that rapport with that client is mm-hmm. also. Oh, helpful. I do that all the time. Yeah. Being able to kind of put yourself in, in their shoes and saying, "Hey, I, you know, I did that, or if it's mm-hmm. something." Or I engaged in this right here mm-hmm. before, but I was able to bounce back from it, or you know, whatever the case may be. I, I, I just think that you you need to be, in my opinion, just careful with how far you're willing yes, to go. Absolutely. Right? Because you need self disclosure? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Well, yeah. Because yes. then some of that can change their perception of you. Exactly. And right? use it against and then, right. Absolutely. It, right. it certainly can right. come up. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I'm very careful about how much mm-hmm. I disclose, right. mm-hmm. and that's just to maintain. The professional environment. Exactly. Another thing that I do is I immediately tell people up front that there are going to be times if our relation, our professional relationship, therapeutic relationship continues, there may be some times where there's going to be some tense moments, mm-hmm. and I'm going to challenge you. Absolutely. And that may lead to it feeling like it's heated or some level of confrontation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to point you back to the very beginning when I informed you of the reason why this is occurring. Absolutely. Because change is not easy. Exactly. You know, so, and there are times when I have to be able to tell you, like, come on, man, knock it off. Like that, for lack of a better term, that was crazy. You can't go out here and do that. For lack right. of a better term. Yeah, I yeah, hate that's, to say crazy in my yeah, that's, too. But you know um, what I mean? But, but not it can be a laughable moment. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes, but yes, come yes. on. Exactly. You, can't come a across, you can't sit across from me and I hear something from you that, you know, and, and, and we, you're not on the thought disorder spectrum. Right. So you're not experiencing hallucinations or delusions. Exactly. And you have some depression, anxiety, which is very real, but it doesn't mm-hmm. come with psychotic features. And you say, hey, doc, this is what I did. And I'm like, bro, come exactly. on, man. Exactly. Like, Usually they know when you, how, when you react. Like, knock it off. Like, how crazy does that sound? Like, you're going to have to laugh with me on right. that one because you know that was ridiculous. And, and sometimes when you repeat it, and they hear it for themselves. Yeah. And they're like, you know what? You're right. Absolutely. Like, that was jacked up. That was messed up. That was kind of crazy. I don't know what I was thinking. Then you can actually dive into the actual thought process and the emotion that's connected to that behavior. Mm-hmm. So definitely, yeah, I get it a lot. Yeah. Okay, great. So we have 12 minutes. I'm going to keep us um, on task. Sure. So I have one more question. Yes. That I need to ask you. Okay. Um, being a professional in this field comes with a lot of discovery and self awareness, and it's vital in helping other people. Mm-hmm. What's the most valuable thing that you've learned about yourself by helping other people? Um, I learned early on that I can only go so far. Mm-hmm. I was literally thinking that. And, and that's what I learned. And I also learned that if I am, maybe in the beginning, I may be working harder than you are. Mm-hmm. But in, in the middle and somewhere where we should be coming to an end, if exactly. I'm continuing to work harder than you are, then this process is not working very well. Okay. And we have to maybe move in, it. We have to do, move in a different direction. Right. Okay. Some different has to occur. And maybe that something different may be removing me from the situation mm-hmm. because I'm not the best fit for it. I want to know, have you had to refer anybody that you could not help? That Absolutely. you felt it was inappropriate for you to continue working with them based on your ability or lack thereof to assist them further? Absolutely, okay. on several occasions. Okay. And, I, and I feel like if you are a good clinician, then mm-hmm. that's going to happen. You know, I'm not going to say more often than not because then you won't be able to earn a living. But right? it is going to happen. But it's going to happen. Right. So... I learned that that's what I take away from it, mm-hmm. I, you know, and the other part that I take away from it um, is what the outside perception is mm-hmm. and the type of energy that you're going to get. Right. Right. So there has to be a certain willingness to accept some of that energy mm-hmm. because you can't present yourself as beyond approach, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Right, because 
you know, my mom is great about throwing me to the wolves, like in the grocery store. <laughs> like, Ken, I'm in a line with somebody, right? And I overheard what they were saying, mm -hmm. and they're having some problems. You need and to you get just over talk it. to them real quick. Oh like, hold on. This right. is my son, Dr. Right. Jack. I love that. I love you, mom. <laughs> but, like, for real. Right. Like, my dad, mm -hmm. my brothers, mm -hmm. my cousins, right. my homeboys. Right? So, I can't be beyond the, the, the approach there. Mm -hmm. Right? But I have to be able to set some limits without, you know, ostracizing anybody. Yeah. Saying, nah, I can't really do that. Right. Like, I... I'd be willing to have an initial conversation with you and say, hey, listen, I'm, I hear what you're saying. The best thing for me to be able to do is maybe put you in a, in a situation where you can't get help. I'm sorry I can't help you beyond this. Right. But I am willing to listen and thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that also matters. Right. But I learned that early on as well is, is that there's a, there's a perception that, that, you know, things need to flow and transpire in a certain way. Right. And some of those expectations we need to meet. Right. So I, I guess well, we got time. Yeah, ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go so ahead, so yeah. my question is, and and this is for I guess maybe all mental health professionals. We all have our the way that we do things, our orientation, you know, the theoretical perspectives um, that we utilize in treatment. What would you say is your primary theoretical theoretical perspective, and what what I guess maybe what is like your most Intuitive or most engaging type of client or diagnosis that you like to work with? Ooh. Doc and a dude? Yeah, so, so, the, um, I'm not the dude though, so we have That's the dude. That's the Instagram. The dude is Doc some the different dude. people. You know, like the Jazz. dude is my brother, the dude is. I'm calling you out. You know, it could be a homie that's going to give you a different perspective. I give you more of the clinical perspective, right. but I feel right. like we need some of that because in order to be able to make it, you know, appropriate for your palate. Sometimes there has to be some comedy associated with it. There has to be some layman's terms yeah. thrown in there because our language can get pretty heavy yeah. uh, and technical. So, um, the, most in, the, the most engaging type of client is somebody who's self-motivated. Love you it. Know, you right. know, who, who can understand that they're willing, and someone who's unafraid to, to I'm not going to say fail, Unafraid to try things, yeah. They don't work, and continue to come back to the drawing board. Absolutely, right. So mm -hmm. th that's a very engaging person, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I also love the individual who had me working very hard at the beginning, mm -hmm. and that light bulb comes on. Oh man, and I'm that's like, and then they can move, that light and then they can move, move and they maneuver, and they're like, hey, you know what? I get it. And you see it. And you can see you it. See that light bulb. Mm -hmm. um, right. So okay. I, I think that that, you know, you know, I hope that answers your question, yeah. but I think that it's dope. My theoretical approaches are sort of like a mixed bag, right? So I'll throw, seriously. I know. I, it's almost I like love a feast it. freestyle it's, rapper. It's, right, it really right, is. right. Like it's, it's a, so it's authentic. A, it's a go with the flow because I have to be willing to sit across from somebody individually and assess where they are and determine right. what they need. But I like br brief solution-focused type therapy stuff. Mm -hmm. I like CBT. I like acceptance mm -hmm. and commitment therapy. Yeah. I like an interpersonal approach, right? Um, I like some thug therapy sometimes, though. <laughs> that reality like, I'm based. with that. Right. That reality-based thug therapy. Right. Like sometimes right. you need that. Like, yeah. people need that. So I'm a mixed bag, yeah. and people will tell you that. You know, I, I saw five different people today. Five different approaches. Four different approaches. Because okay. two people had very similar issues. Right, right, but I right. had four different approaches going on today. Right. So the other thing that I would tell folks, this is an art form. Mm -hmm. Right? It's very much an art form. You have to hone your craft. Absolutely. You have to work at it. Mm -hmm. You have to research. You have to be unafraid. You have to try certain things. And when those things don't work, um, make sure that you're not trying them in a situation that potentially lends itself to mm -hmm. harm with other people. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when it doesn't work, you have to be able to, to say, okay, I'm going I'm to throw that out the window mm -hmm. right. and we're going to start over. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, because I feel like it, it's not working. But there are a lot of folks that don't hone the craft. And what I mean by hone the craft is it seems to be much more natural and real when I have studied enough of this to be able to have a conversation with you mm -hmm. and I don't have to check the book. Right. 
I, I don't have time to say, hold on, wait a minute. So on page 17, right. Right. it says, you know, thoughts, feelings, opinions lead themselves. Like, no, you got to hone your craft. Right. You got to study. You have to work at it. Mm -hmm. Because then people, people recognize that and they understand it. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it becomes much more of a natural process and a much more of a natural conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not choppy. It's not disjointed. Exactly. It doesn't feel like it's been, you know, developed in a laboratory, right? so to speak. Because sometimes people feel like they come to therapy sessions in a laboratory rest. Right? They do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, you know, the joke is sitting across from me, straight experiment. <laughs> just joke. doing checks. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you got yeah. you have to you have to hone your craft. Right. Okay. Right. Hmm. Do you have more to that? I don't want you to feel like okay cuts you off. No, yeah, she makes this, she, listen, you make this hero, though, right? I'm trying to keep like, us in You know, I'm very good at paying attention to body right. language and social right. arms here. She's I'm like, trying to make sure. Okay. Okay. It, it, it's kind of like a soft okay, like but with a little, yeah. little. But if you have more, we want to know what you have to say. That's why we invited no, you. Oh so. no, no, no! I'm good. I'm okay, good. and frankly, I just don't want to forget my answer as well. Okay. Well, yeah, well then, how about you go next? Go ahead, then. No, I just wanted to kind of, I guess, maybe say that. I, I kind of always tell my clients that although I have the license and, you know, have done the research, they're still the expert in the room of them. Absolutely. They know themselves better than anybody else would ever. So having them to understand that makes that therapeutic process easier because they're able to dive in. They may not be able to articulate mm -hmm. what they're feeling or what they're thinking, but being able to, again... Once you hone your craft, you'll be able to kind of pull that out of them. Absolutely. With, with no problem. Okay, so I want to answer your original question, feeding, uh, piggybacking off what, okay. you know, the, okay. the, the Dr. Jasper's comment was. So my thing with, I prefer, I'm like CBT reality, but more reality-based therapy, mm -hmm. right? Like I deal with the realness in the moment. Mm -hmm. What can we do here and now? You know, existential, right. whatever. I, I deal with the here and now. And how can I, we help you now? How can we help you exactly. now? I don't want to help you last week mm -hmm. uh, when your mother cursed you out and your feelings were hurt and you're still upset about it. I can't help you with that, right? right. Mm -hmm. But I can help right. you now focus on something that will assist you in getting through the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes in, I tend to like, my, my demographic that I, I, I seem to do best with is depressed and anxious women. Mm -hmm. uh, depressed and anxiety I mean that's something that I love to work with um, I have I think a handle on that and then children I like working with kids um, I was trained in play therapy and I like to play I like to sit there and play Uno and you know almost catch them in moments of discussing right. when they and think they we're it. just playing yeah. to me it's such a sense of accomplishment when they leave when, when they leave and I say are you okay now and then they go they're looking for reasons not to be but they can't find the reason sure. to be right. not okay. Right. So then I, I like that with working with kids. And then with the depressed and anxious women, I make sure when they come to me, you know, when they're crying during the first session, that I say, what do you expect from this? Because a lot of times people come to us, and if we don't understand their expectation, mm -hmm. we may be artificially helping them. Like on the surface, right. we're helping them. Right. We're not really helping them. Right. When they leave, they act like they're all right. And then they're saying, I didn't learn anything about myself and I haven't accomplished anything. Oh, but I asked them, yeah. I asked the women specifically, what are you looking for? Because our language, none of our languages are the same. And when they tell me they don't know, mm -hmm. I let them just sit. And then I ask them what's not working in their lives. And that's when they're really articulating what they expect, but they don't know that. Mm -hmm. They're saying, hey, um, my marriage is like this. I love the person that I'm with, but this isn't working for me. And so we're able to start with, what can you do for it to work for you better? Mm -hmm. And eventually, within two or three weeks, they're able to give real responses and then really work through something. And to me, it's most rewarding every week when I do the check-in and say, well, how you feel coming in here now based on how you felt last week? What was the number, one through ten, last week right. you were? And when they sure. give me right. a lower number, I get very excited. And I'm just like, yes! You know, she was a five last week, a four now. I am doing something, something out of what we did last week work, and then I ask them what worked for you. Right. And they'll tell Absolutely. me exactly what I said that resonated, but that gives me the ammunition I need for the next session mm -hmm. to touch on right. what worked for that one person. Mm -hmm. And that's the model I used every time. And that's what I like. 
Mm-hmm. I think I'm a, a lot eclectic than I thought I was. Mm-hmm. Um, being trained in a lot of different types of therapies, mm-hmm. whether that's CBT or motivational or person-centered or existential or DBT most recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of like that. Most, I people, like DBT most, most people don't like DBT for some, and that's dialectical behavioral therapy, but that's more of the on the severe end, moderate mm-hmm. to severe mm-hmm. types of symptoms. So I, I kind of like those types of things. Not mm-hmm. I've actually utilized a lot of those things just in regular therapy sessions, whether it's mm-hmm. anxiety or depression or um, teaching those, those distress tolerant skills and uh, mindfulness, I'm, I'm kind of big on meditation and yoga and things like that. And th- those particular types of therapies introduce those types of techniques. Well, well, nobody says that you can't use all of them. Exactly. Right? There's no book that says right. one is not contraindicated versus another. Right. Contraindicated. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's right. Oh, I'm going to look at that. Go ahead, finish. I've never heard this word. But, you know, it's, it's right. nobody says it. Right. Yeah. I know. So I, I think that, that you do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you kind of throw it all in the pot and you pull it out as you need. Exactly. You know, and, and, and of course there are certain people present with certain issues, disorders, that you may have to follow a specific treatment protocol. Right. Right. And those are specialized circumstances. Mm-hmm. But the large majority of people that are going to seek treatment in, in, in this country are experiencing depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. um, you know, with, brought on by a host of, mm-hmm. of different issues. Yeah. Mixed in here with some physiological issues that are going on exactly. upstairs that are lending themselves right. to what you're experiencing. Mm-hmm. But the other piece is we're usually where there's depression, there's anxiety. Usually where there's anxiety, there's depression. They're kind of, they're, they're married in that respect. Mm-hmm. It's rare that someone's mm-hmm. depressed and they don't experience some, They don't get anxious at times. Right. And vice versa. It's rare that someone gets anxious and then doesn't get depressed Absolutely. as a function of experiencing that level of anxiety because mm-hmm. it's preventing them from achieving or exactly. performing or excelling. Mm-hmm. So, um, but the large majority of folks come in, they're depressed, they're anxious. Um, you know, a lot of children have behavioral issues across the board, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, so you just kind of throw it all at them. Throw it on the wall, see what sticks. Okay, well, numero uno, contraindicated, is a word for you viewers <laughs> who are like me and you have not ever heard that word before. But it was used so eloquently right. today that I doubted it. You thought it, for a I moment, thought but it you're up? so smart. I oh, I didn't enough. really doubt it, but I was like, let me see it. I have to see it. So anyway, it's after seven. It's seven oh three. So okay. we need to wrap up. But um, I'm just you know we're paying for this. Time keeper. It's okay. We are in a nice studio. We know we don't live here, so they know we're paying for it. Right. And we need to go. So basically, we want to. You got something you want to say? No, I was going to say like make sure. That- Jasper put his info But I'm about there. to do that, right? Yeah, I got you. Mm. So, I'm, I'm you, yeah, right I learned there, from man. you the last time. Okay. So, we want to make sure that the people watching, because sure. we know that there will be more people watching today because you're on, because Dr. Jasper is quite a popular fellow. Yeah. I learned on Instagram today yeah. when he posted about this, and it reached 700 people within an hour. So, basically, we want to know so they know how to reach you and how to get to you. So, you need to tell them where to look you up. Okay. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Doc and Adu, at D-O-C-N-D-A-D-U-D-E. Uh, you can email me at Doc and Adu 1 at Gmail. So, that's Doc and Adu, like I just spelled it, D-O-C-N-D-A-D-U-D-E. Okay. Can 1 at Gmail. Can you slow that down? Doc and Adu. Doc, D-O-C-N-D-A, D-U-D-E. 1 at Gmail. Or at Doc in the Do on Facebook, Instagram. It's so Instagram. real. It's such a real address. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Or, so. <laughs> and or Dr. Kendall Jasper is my other uh, Instagram. So okay. I s- oh, yeah, separated too. some of that out. Yeah. I'll look up that. Um, okay. That so. was that was that's the new baby. That was recent. Okay, I thought that was because it's only like ninety four followers. Yeah, I looked that up. It was recent. So I looked that up. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna act like I haven't. So um, we want to tell you, you know, thank you for being our guest. Definitely. We really appreciate having you. I knew you wouldn't let the people down, and you have agreed to come back soon. In sure. Maybe a few weeks if you're available. Um, three or four weeks, maybe next month or so, no. and to touch no. on another issue. Sure. Okay. And I want to tell you all, thank you for having. Me. 
Mm-hmm. I can't get lost in this. You I were one of our top choices. Absolutely. Inviting me to come and share and asking such great questions. Okay, That's well, awesome. I'm going to keep talking to you like this because you write my checks. So, <laughs> we appreciate you. Yeah, um, absolutely. Anyway, absolutely. catch us next week at 6 o'clock. I'm not sure if we'll have another guest next week, but we'll be covering the same type of topics. Um, yes. You know, something in mental health. We may choose a diagnosis to touch on or um, some specific issues that people mm-hmm. are messaging us about. Yes, I want to make sure absolutely. that we tell people that they can message the couch with any of their inquiries or you can message Damien personally or me personally mm-hmm. and your information is confidential. Absolutely. Um, any issues that you may have and you can find us both on psychologytoday.com mm-hmm. um, for private practice. Yes. Okay? My Anything government, else? most people know my government name. So I'm known as Dame Dash. That's my alias. Damien Harmon. Right. That's his name. So, the Couch 704. The Couch the 704. Couch. Yes. Go. Message. It's yeah. all good. Here it is. You always, you always make me laugh. <laughs> anyway, okay, bye. We'll see you next week. All right, y'all. Y'all be easy. Are you going to? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Go ahead and manage that. Deuces. You crazy. You did a good job.